The Isagogi of Porphyry, Lesson 1, on Genus. Porphyry is going to jump right into an explanation of genus. So before we begin, we're going to cover a couple of key terms which are going to help you understand what he's talking about, what he means. The first term that we're going to look at is predicate. The predicate is that which is affirmed or denied of a subject in a categorical proposition. It's from the Latin predicare, to assert. So in other words, a predicate is just something which is said or denied about something else. A standard sentence structure has a subject-predicate arrangement, where the subject is the thing you're talking about, and the predicate is what is stated about it. This usually involves an object-property relationship. So for example, this, the very simple sentence, Aristotle is wise. That has a subject and a predicate. The subject of that sentence is Aristotle. Aristotle is the subject and the predicate is wise. Aristotle is wise. So we have linked the idea of a wise person to Aristotle. We have affirmed that Aristotle is this thing. He is wise. So to predicate something is to assign it to a subject. So in an arrangement like blank is wise. We may say that wise is predicated of whomever fills in the blank. To say the car is red is to predicate red of the car. So when he's talking about predicating things, it's assigning whatever is being predicated, it's assigning it to the subject, the subject that he's talking about. Genus is a collection of subjects which share a general aspect. That's where we get the word general from genus. So for example, a triangle is a plane figure. In other words, a two-dimensional figure. That's what kind of thing a triangle is. Plato is an Athenian. That's the kind of person that Plato is. So the genus that triangles belong to is the genus of plane figures. That's the kind of thing it is. Plato belongs to the genus of Athenians because that's the kind of person he is. They share a general aspect. All right, this most simply answers the question, what is a thing? So you can ask, what is a man? The answer, man is an animal. He belongs to the genus animal. Now keep in mind that in philosophy, a genus has a little bit different meaning than in biology. In taxonomy and biology, there, there actually is a specific place in the hierarchy that is just for genus. So at the bottom you have species, and then above that is genus, and above that is family. And that's specific to biology. In philosophy, genus could be any category of things that share a general aspect, kind of anywhere on that. You could speak of a genus anywhere on a hierarchy of things like that. Okay, so a triangle is a plane figure. We just assign this category of things these two-dimensional figures, geometric figures, and we just created a uh, genus for them in our minds. All right, that's the kind of thing it is, and a triangle is one of those kinds of things. Now, an accident is that which is non-essential to the nature of a thing, and which depends on the substance of a thing to be manifested. So, a very simple way to think of this is an accident is anything that any subject has, which you can you can take that accident away from the subject and it doesn't change what the subject is. Or you can add an accent to that subject and it doesn't change what it is, right? So if you have, if you have a cup of tea, okay, that the thing that it is is tea. Now you can heat it up and it becomes hot tea or you can put ice cubes in it and make iced tea and that changes the accidents. Hot is an accident, cold is an accident for tea, but it doesn't change what it is, right? So for example, the triangle is a large plane figure, right? We already established what the genus of triangle is, what kind of thing it is. Now it could be a large triangle, small triangle, all kinds of things. That doesn't change what it is. Plato is a well-dressed Athenian. That is an accident of Plato. He happens to be well-dressed. Tomorrow, he might be wearing his jeans with, with holes in it to go cut the grass. He would still be Plato the Athenian. 
He's just not well dressed anymore because that's an accident. It does not affect what he is. So now that we know what Porphyria is talking about with these words, let's try and follow along. Chapter 2 on genus. Neither genus nor species appear to be simply denominated, for that is called genus which is a collection of certain things, subsisting in a certain respect relatively to one thing, and to each other, according to which signification the genus of the Heraclidae is denominated from the habitude from one, I mean Hercules, and from the multitude of those who have alliance to each other from him, denominated according to separation from other genera. Okay, so denominated in Latin, nomine means name, so denominated just means it is named, or when you name something, you're categorizing it, you're, you're calling it what it is. So, neither genus nor species appear to be simply denominated, but a genus is a collection of certain things subsisting in a certain respect relative to one thing. So these are all different things, different subjects that all share the same relationship to one thing. Okay, so he's talking about the genus of the Heraclidae. The Heraclidae were a ruling family in ancient times that was descended from Hercules. Okay, but anybody who is descended from Hercules is a Heraclidae. So in this case, their genus is Heraclidae, and what they share in common is they all have in common with each other that they're all descended from one source, Hercules. So that is the relationship to the one thing and also the relationship they have with each other within that genus. And that's what he's talking about here. The multitude of those who have alliance to each other from him denominate according to separation from other genera. So in other words, there are other genuses or genera besides the Heraclidae. And what makes them different is that those guys in the other families, the other genera, are not descended from Heracles. Hercules, sorry. Again, after another manner also, the principle of the generation of everyone is called genus, whether from the generator or from the place in which a person is generated. For thus we say that Orestes had his genus from Tantalus, Hylus from Hercules, and again that Pindar was by genus a Theban, but Plato an Athenian. For country is a certain principle of each man's generation, in the same manner as a father. So genus, the word itself, actually has to do with the idea of generation or origin. All right, it's related to our word genesis. Where something comes from, that establishes a certain relationship and a category right there. And that's what he's talking about here. So not only people that are ancestors could constitute a genus, people who all share the same ancestry, but also a place. Where are you from? Plato is an Athenian, but Pindar was a Theban. They have different genera. They, they belong to different categories based on where they're from. And what they share in common with everybody else in that genus is that all those people are from Thebes, or all those people in the Athenian genus are from Athens. Still, this signification appears to be most ready, for they are called Heraclidae, who derive their origin from the genus of Hercules and Cacropidae, who are from Cecrops, also their next of kin. The first genus, moreover, is so-called, which is the principle of each man's generation, but afterwards the number of those who are from one principle, like from Hercules, which defining and separating from others, we call the whole collected multitude the genus of the Heraclidae. Okay, so in ancient times, there were particular ruling families who were descended from Hercules, and often they used that to claim their right to rule. But there were different families in different countries who were all who all made that claim. So what he's saying here is that even though you have a generating principle, you have a family line, my father, my grandfather, his grandfather, all the way back to Hercules, there are other families that aren't your family that also have a line that goes back to Hercules. So they all share that in common, and they're all in the same genus of the Heraclidae. Besides, genus differs from difference and from accidents in common, because though differences and accidents in common are predicated of many things, different also in species, yet they are not so in reply to what a thing is, but what kind of thing it is. So, now he's discussing difference and accidents. Remember how we defined accidents at the beginning. And he's pointing out that 
Remember, genus answers the question, what is a thing? Now we're talking about descriptors that answer what kind of a thing it is. So these would be things that are within a genus, but we want to distinguish it. We want to get even more specific within that genus. Okay, we know what it is, but what kind of thing is it? And that's going to employ difference and accidents to describe that. For when some persons ask what that is of which these are predicated, we reply, that is genus. But we do not assign and answer differences and accidents, since they are not predicated of a subject as to what a thing is, but rather as to what kind of thing it is. For in reply to the question, what kind of a thing man is, we say that he is rational. And in answer to what kind of a thing a crow is, we say that it is black. Yet rational is difference, but black is accident. So what he's pointing out here is that when we want to talk about what kind of thing it is, we can either state the genus or assume the genus. In this case, we don't have to state the genus because we already know, everyone already knows. Now, if somebody doesn't know in a discussion, it can be helpful to state the genus first and then get specific. But in this case, everybody knows what a man is. A man is a living being, he's an animal. We Everybody knows what a crow is. What genus is a crow? What's a bird? So when we're asking the question, what kind of a thing man is, we say that he is rational. Why do we say that? Because man is an animal. There's a lot of subjects within that genus animal that are not rational. So when we're discussing that, what kind of animal is he? He's rational. That's a difference that distinguishes him from the other ones in that genus. And likewise with a crow. We know what birds are. So we ask what kind of a thing a crow is. We know it's a in the genus bird, but we say it's black. Now black is an accident. Color is often considered an accident. So we're describing how this bird looks because that's what's going to distinguish it for us from other birds, other things in that genus. When, however, we we are asked what man is, we answer an animal. But animal is the genus of man, so that from genus being predicated of many, it is diverse from individuals, which are predicated of one thing only. But from being predicated of things different in species, it is distinguished from such as are predicated as species or as properties. That's basically what I said earlier, that man belongs to the genus animal, but there's many other creatures in that genus also, so we have to use further things to distinguish what kind of animal he is when we're talking about man. We have to get more specific. We're moving now towards species, which deals with specific. Moreover, because it is predicated in reply to what a thing is, it is distinguished from differences and from accidents commonly, which are severally predicated of what they are predicated, not in reply to what a thing is, but what kind of thing it is, or in what manner it subsists. The description, therefore, of the conception of genus, when it, which has been enunciated, contains nothing superfluous, nothing deficient. So all he's saying is that genus is a very simple kind of category, and we're going to use other words and other terms to describe things more specifically. But the concept of genus that he just delivered, it contains nothing superfluous. It's not, there's not extra stuff, nothing deficient. It does its job, it's very simple. Genus just describes that one grouping of things which all share something in common. And that's pretty much it. It answers what a thing is. Now remember, it can be there can be different levels of genus, if you will. All right, there's not just one level. And by that I mean we talk about animal as a genus for man. Okay, but we also talk about the Heraclidae as a genus. Well, are, are those men? Are those human beings? Are they animals? Yes, they are. So they are beings within the genus animal. And they're, they're specific. They've been distinguished from all the other creatures that are animals because they're human. But they're also in the genus Heraclidae, right? So when I say that there's different levels of it, just keep in mind what a genus is and how it works. When we're talking about, we're establishing a verbal category of thought where everything in that category bears a common relationship. They share something in common, as the definition says. So that's the end of chapter two on genus. So just to recap the key terms, we have predicate, 
that which is affirmed or denied of a subject in a categorical proposition. The simplest way to predicate something of something else is just to affirm it with is or deny it with is not. So Aristotle is wise. We predicated wise of Aristotle. Or we could say Plato is not well-dressed. We predicated by denial well-dressed of Plato. We're assigning it to a subject. Genus is a collection of subjects which share a general aspect. General from genus having to do with generate, origin. Okay, Example, a triangle is a plane figure. Plato is an Athenian, like we said. They all share a general aspect. But now we're going to look at a new one getting ready for the next chapter, and that is species. Okay, the species is the essence of a subject. It is specific, having to do with species. So within genus, there are species. For example, a triangle is a three-sided plane figure. All right, we talked about how a triangle is a two-dimensional geometric plane figure, but so also is a square, so is a circle, all these things. And those are not triangles because they're, they all share the same genus. They all share that same aspect. They're two-dimensional figures. But what is the essence of a triangle? What makes it what it is? Well, it has three sides. Triangle is a three-sided plane figure, and that's what makes it a triangle. Specific. Plato is an Athenian philosopher. That's what makes him who and what he is.